Good morning, church. Good morning, church, here in uh, the building, and then all of you at home, uh, hopefully tuning in and uh, watching, and you're, you're going to join in, and we'll all worship here together this morning. We are all practicing great social distancing here, and I welcome you all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we have gathered to worship. We have gathered in our homes, our living rooms, our kitchens, our dining rooms to worship the Lord and so let's do that this morning. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voices and with us sing. So I encourage you, in the room here, let's stand this morning. And if you're at home, I encourage you, don't be a spectator, but join in with us. And let's sing together and let's worship together this morning. We will be reading 
Psalm 103, for you at home, you can get your Bibles out, or the words may be on the screen in front of you. We're going to do this a little different. I'm going to pray as we read this. So we'll, you can keep your eyes open. You don't have to bow your head or anything, but read this and then pray along with me as, as we kind of pray through this scripture. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Father, we just ask that our inmost being would just delight in you and that, that everything we are worships you. Lord, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Lord, you, you have done great things for us. You have changed our lives. You've saved us. You've, you've instilled your spirit within us that we can worship you. You have given us faith that we have purpose and meaning in life. Who forgives all your iniquity. Lord, what a benefit that you have taken our sins and cast it away. Who heals all your diseases. Father, at this time, we pray for those of us in our midst that, that do have sicknesses or, or, or infirmities. Uh, we pray for Bill Lanier. We pray for Fred Long and Fred Skipper. We ask you to continue to heal Helen Miller and, and strengthen her. We pray for Linda Tichy, Orly Simmons, and Melanie Smith. Lord, and there are others amongst us that have infirmities or, or diseases that are, are going on. Lord, we specifically think of this whole coronavirus thing, Lord. We ask your protection on that. Lord, we pray for those who are on the front lines, uh, Kim and Zach Brunzink, uh, Jay and Jamie Lyons, Andrew and Hannah Hill, Natalia Goings, and Richard and Marie Lord, protect them, keep them safe as they deal with patients who may be sick. Um, Lord, glorify yourself uh, in their lives as they, as they seek to minister others. Verse 4, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Lord, all of us have found ourselves in pits. It's often they're pits of our own making. But Lord, you are in the the business of redeeming lives. And Lord, we bless you because you have redeemed us and are in the process of redeeming us. And who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Lord, we recognize that you are the giver of good things. Even in this craziness that we have right now, you are giving us good things. Chances to be closer as a family, um, chances to walk away from our, our busy schedules and take time to meditate and think of you. In verse 6, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. Lord, you make known how we should walk, and we can look back on our lives and as the people of Israel saw the pillar of fire by day and the, pil the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day and, the, and the, the walls of the Red Sea, we have things in our own life that we can look back on and say, look what God has done. And we can remember that and draw strength and courage from that. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Lord, that defines you. He will not always chide, nor he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. And Lord, we so thankful for that case because we deserve complete death and destruction. But you do not repay us according to that because of what you have done through your son. You have, as it says, um, 
For as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. That is such a glorious thought, Lord, that when you look upon us, you see Jesus. And our transgressions are as from the east to the west. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Lord, help us to always remember that without you, we are nothing. We are dust of the earth. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. Lord, help us to remember that our life is but a, a, a vapor. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And that only what we do unto you lasts for eternity. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. Father, I thank you for that promise that we can instill in our children and their children a sense of who you are and, bes and, and, and your righteousness can reach down unto them. To those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you, his, you, his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works. In all places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O my soul. Lord, I just pray that this earth would be full of your glory and reflect it back to you, offered in praise, because you are the creator God who sustains all. And we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.
this is our confidence in Christ Jesus, that he who has been faithful will be faithful. I'd like to read uh, from Psalm 40 uh, as we enter into our next song. In an unpredictable and time of uncertainty such as this, um, let us have confidence that the steadfast love of the Lord delivers and is faithful to us. Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man and woman who makes the Lord their trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. And yet, in verse 9, I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips. As you know, O Lord, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. And as for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me and will ever preserve us, GCT. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. In this uncertain time, verse 16, But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord, he takes thought of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. So we're going to sing an adaptation of Psalm 40, what we've just read, and I pray that it will be the prayer of your heart during this time. <laughs> Your thoughts for us are too countless. 
as we sang and do it again, that we look back and you have been faithful and we see that you've been faithful in Scripture and then we look into our own lives, Lord, and we see your faithfulness in our lives. And so that we know that we come to you, we wait for your deliverance, we wait for you to move on our behalf, and as we seek after you, you fill us with joy and you fill us with peace and you fill us with loving kindness and you fill us with your mercy and you fill us up, Lord, while we're empty. And looking forward, we have confidence in our hope in you. And we know that you who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it and perfect it until the day of the Lord Jesus. And so we have confidence that you will indeed, through whatever trials or tribulations or even pestilence or pandemic comes our way. You will hold us fast, and you will never let us go, Lord. And this is our confidence in you this morning. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through my spiritual path.
Praise the Lord. You all may be seated in here as we continue from God's Word. So we're going to just take one more moment where we're going to not ask the Lord for anything. Uh, since probably most of us have been in that mode for quite a while. I'm not going to ask him for anything. We just want to praise him. And there's going to be a screen right there, if you're at home, that will help you as, as families at home or individuals at home. Let's just sit in our homes, kneel, get on your knees, however you want to do this, and let's just take some moments and, uh, and pray. Praise the Lord in this way, and any other way if you would like. Let's do that right now. Father, we praise you for your wisdom, for your sovereignty, for your love, protection, for your provision, Lord, for your endless mercy. Lord, there's a million other things that we can praise you for. Father, I pray that we would, as we slow down and have the time in our lives, Lord, bring it to our minds every day more and more ways that we can praise you. Father, we praise you for being in control and for your plan, your perfect plan being worked out today and tomorrow and the next day. Lord, your plan is being worked out by you, the God who cares for us, the God who loves us, the, the God who is in control, the God who, who who we can cry to, Lord, when things don't make sense. And you hear us and you love it when we do that. Lord, when fear takes over our lives, love it when we come to, to you for our our calming salve Lord Father you are at hand therefore we shall not be anxious Lord you are at hand so that we can come to you with all prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and make our requests known to you Lord Thank you so much for that privilege. Lord, that you are faithful. You have always been faithful. You're faithful today. You'll be faithful tomorrow. You'll be faithful next week, next month, next year. You're always faithful. I praise you for your faithfulness.
Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, forgive us of our debts. And Lord, pray that we'd also forgive all of our debtors. Lord, let it lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Father, give us your Holy Spirit in an overwhelming way this morning. Lord, clear out our hearts for your presence. Lord, wherever we may be, as a church, Lord, let your presence be experienced this morning, just as if we were in here together as the body of Christ. Father, pray for uh, limited distractions in our homes. Pray that you would speak through your word, or give us encouragement as well as, or just truth that cuts really hard today as we go through this. Lord, just give us a mind that, a mindset, a heart set that you declare here in Luke 9, Lord, or that you command us to have to be followers of you. Father, pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're in Luke 9, starting in verse 18. And so as you go there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind us of Romans 8.32. To remind us of what this promise is that we have, so that we completely understand what Jesus is promising through, through Luke 9. Uh, Romans 8.32 Remember this, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, right? You got that? But he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously, graciously with favor, do what? Give us all things. It's not on the screen, it's in my head, it's in the Bible. How will he not also give us everything? All things that we need for this, to live on this earth and for eternal life. Everything that we need, graciously he gives them to us. All things, all things, all things, all things. That's a, it's, that's a question mark, right? Question mark. So the answer is what? He will graciously give us all things that we need. Because why? Because he has not spared his own son, and he gave, it, gave him to us freely. So he's not going to spare us anything. Graciously give us this. And so as we go through this in, Roman, in Luke 9, these, these statements that Jesus gives us, you know, you hear, these, you hear this scripture all our life, and we think we understand it. I think I understand it. And then I get into it this week, and I go, oh, I'm such a failure at this. It's, it's so to read this scripture of what Jesus commands from us and then to go, am I doing that? Like, how does that impact my life every single day to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him? But to understand what he's saying there is he wants us to do this. This is the big picture of this. He wants us to do this so that, so that, we do not exchange these lesser blessings of what the world can give for his greater abundant blessings, right? He has so much greater blessings that he wants to just pour upon us, and he's saying this, I want you to have these greater blessings, but you need to give up these lesser ones. So in Luke 9, 18, 
Jesus is praying. Right? Now it had happened that as he was praying, this is Jesus praying. So every time you see in Luke or in the Gospels, when Jesus is praying, something big is about to happen. It's huge. And so this right here is huge. It's really, really important. It's really big. He's praying. Is it Jesus is praying? Son of God, God, second person of the Trinity. How much more important is for us to pray, church? So I'm thinking this week as people send me memes, as people send me stuff, and they're like really catchy and really, really interesting, that are like talking about what we should be doing at this time. How much more are we to be, this whole time, I'm just convinced more and more and more, and God's just like, I want you to get on your knees and your face and just come to me and pray to me that I will move in this whole thing. I'm moving it no matter what, but I want you to, pr- I want you to find out and be absolutely at peace at what's happening. I want you to be at peace with because I got this under control. What's going on? I, he's, and Jesus is going, I'm working out my plan. This is, this is, I'm working this out. I've got this. Do not be anxious. Do not be fearful. I'm working out my plan. Come to me and let me know your fears and anxieties. And so here he is with his disciples. He had just fed 20,000 people, right? He just did. And so some, some way, somehow, they got away. Maybe he went back in the boat, right? Remember last week? Maybe he went back, got back in the boat and they have some peace and quiet in the boat. Maybe not. But they've gotten away from all these people and it's Jesus and his disciples. And here's Jesus praying. The disciples were with him. And Jesus asked his disciples, hey guys, who did, you know, when you were serving the bread and the fish and all the, you're, you're taking care of all the people and getting them food, you know, you're out there, who did they say who I was? Who did the crowd say that I am? And so here's their answer. Uh, some think you're John the Baptist. Now this was not, this was a respectful thought. They, the Jews loved John the Baptist. Man, he went up to the, to the Romans, he was like, he was hammering on the Romans. He was fearless. So it, it, this wasn't this uh, like derogatory comment from the crowd. It was actually encouraging. They think you're John the Baptist. Or the spirit of John the Baptist. Or John the Baptist come right from the dead. Something like that. So this wasn't a derogatory term. Or, it's, but others say you're Elijah. Again, this is a great compliment. Back in Malachi, the prophets were saying, in fact, the Jews had looked over from the last 500 years that somebody in the spirit of Elijah, John the Baptist, would come in before the Messiah would come. And so they were looking for Elijah, the spirit of Elijah, to come for 500 years. And so some some people are like, oh, this is Elijah, the spirit of Elijah. This is who he is. So again, this is not some derogatory comment. This is actually encouraging. This is a respectful comment about who they thought Jesus was. The third thing that they thought about Jesus was this, a prophet of old. Again, encouraging compliment of who they thought maybe Jesus was. In the line of what? Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the prophets. It would be a great compliment. You're a great prophet, Jesus. But that is not who Jesus is, right? And and so this question that Jesus asks, do you know there's a right and wrong answer to it? There's a correct answer to this. That's why Jesus is asking the question. We can't make up an answer and it be right. In fact, those three answers are what? They're wrong. And Jesus wants to point out, is, I'm so much more than a prophet. I'm so much more than just a miracle maker, miracle worker. I'm not just Mary's son. Some people just thought that. Who's that dude? That's Mary's son. He's, he's more than a great teacher. And so Jesus, he wants all of us in here to ask ourselves this question. In fact, everybody in the world, whoever ever sees this video, if there's anybody that sees this video, <laughs> is this. We have to, this is the perfect time to ask us this question, to let Jesus ask this question. And this is his question. Then he turns, he turns the question to the disciples, 12 guys, right? And he goes, who do you say that I am? And so all week long, as I was going through this, Jesus was like this, Steve Marshall, who do you say that I am? And that question has got to be personalized, church. 
for all of us. This is the time for us to ask ourselves this question. Get, let Jesus get in your face and go, who do you say that I am now? Am I still Lord? Or did all this stuff kind of sneak up on me? Who do you say that I am? And so there's a right and there's a wrong answer. And now who do you think spoke up? Peter, the guy that who's about to die, deny him. This is about a year, a year into, a year up. There's a year before his death, right? Jesus' death. So they have about a year to go, approximately. And here's Jesus. He answers for all the 12. Can you imagine, I mean, just, I, can you imagine they're sitting there, pro I'm just thinking at night, a little campfire going, full belly, it's fish and bread. And they're just hanging out, Jesus praying. Who do you say that I am? And Peter goes, you are the Christ of God. There it is. There's the right answer. So what the Christ of God, in fact, some of your Bibles might say the Messiah of God. It's the same word. The Messiah, the Mashi Mashiach, is the Hebrew word for anointed. The anointed one. The anointed one of God. Christ, if it's your Bible says the Christ of God, that's the Greek term. It's the same word, same meaning, which is anointed. You're the anointed one of God. So it's, whether it's a Messiah or Christos, it's you are the anointed one. You are the one that God took and has made the king of the kingdom, the one who has come to take all away all the sins of the world. And Jesus goes, verse 21, basically says this. It doesn't say it here, but it's implied in this. You're correct, Peter. Ding, 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 ding. Correct answer. And he strict, Jesus said, do not tell this to anyone. Hello? Did you, I would expect the different answer, correct? You're right, Peter. Go tell everybody. And Jesus goes, you're right. Don't tell anybody. And in fact, in John 6, 6.15, this is why. After, in John's story of this whole story, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him, Jesus, by force to make him king, this political king, this political king ruler, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Jesus didn't want that to happen. He did not want everybody to take him, like put him up on a throne, hey, we got the political leader, we got the political leader. He didn't want that to happen. He was like, that, guys, it's not time to do that. In fact, I'm not a political leader. That's not the kingdom. That's not my kingdom. My kingdom is the kingdom that I'm going to set up in your, in your hearts right now. My kingdom is, at, is realized in, our, in your heart. And, and so please, don't tell anybody right now. I don't want that to happen. And so, verse 22. Jesus then does this. Through his answer, he gives the disciples more insight into who he is. Okay? And this is, this is really, really important. So first of all, you have the, the right answer, which is the anointed one of God. He is the anointed, the, the Christ, the Messiah of God. He is the one who is uh, coming to set up the kingdom in our heart. And then Jesus says in verse 22, the son of man, and he's saying that's about me, that's Jesus, the son of man, I'm the son of man, must suffer many things. And so when Jesus says that to the disciples, the disciples actually knew what he was talking about. There's a, so much more involved in this that we today might, might miss. Because here are these Jewish, these Jewish disciples, apostles, and they when, they when they hear Son of Man, they think to back to Daniel 7. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. This is who the Son of Man is, and Jesus says, I'm the Son of Man. Look at this. I saw in the night vision, visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, this is Daniel's prophecy, there came one like what? A son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, that's the father, 
God the Father, and was presented before him and to, to him, as the Son of Man, to the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, all nations, all languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. Shall what? Yeah, come on. Shall what? Shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that what? Shall not be destroyed. When Jesus says, I'm the son of man, this is, this is so much more than this. It's so much more than when, if, if Jesus says, who do you think I am? If you go, well, you're just a man that makes my life better. You give me a better life now. You're that kind of Jesus. You, give my, you, you make my life so much better. You make my marriage better. You make everything. Yes, that's what happens with Jesus. But he's so much more than that, right? He is the one who has this dominion. These, that he, is the, he is the king of all peoples, all nations, all languages. It will never pass away, and it shall never be destroyed. So when he says, I'm the son of man, disciples, understand it's so much, it's so much more than what the crowd was saying. And, and, and even to the disciples, oh, you don't, I know you said I'm the anointed one, but I'm so much more than the anointed one. And then look at this. When he says, I'm the, the one who must suffer many things, they knew that he, he's referring back to Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. They knew this. So let's just go back to Isaiah 53 and read some of these, these scriptures, 4 through 11, when Jesus says, I am the suffering servant, I'm the one who must suffer much. The disciples knew, oh yeah, Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet says this about the one who is to come. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. This is a prophecy of Jesus, the king coming and what he was going to endure. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus was oppressed. Jesus was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb is led to the slaughter. And, a, and like a sheep that before his shears is silent. Jesus did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. Stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was, he has put him to grief. The father has put the son to grief when his soul makes it, when Jesus makes an offering for guilt, for my, for my guilt, church. Then Jesus will see his offspring. Who are his offspring? Here we are. We are his offspring. When he lays down his life, he's going to see that his offspring, his days shall be prolonged, eternity. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteousness, that's us, and he shall bear their iniquities. So, man, there's so much more to this in here, isn't it? When he goes, hey, the Son of Man, I have a dominion that's everlasting. I have a kingdom that will never, ever be put to shame. This is me. I'm the king of it. And by the way, I'm also a suffering servant. I'm going to do all this for you. I'm going to take away all the sins of the world. I'm going to take all the wrath of God away. I'm going to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. I'm going to be killed and on the third day be raised. And all this, he just dumped on the disciples can you imagine what they're thinking i'm you know you have like you ever have campfire conversations go on a good camping trip all kinds of stories come up some deep a lot of them really not deep <laughs> all kinds of crazy crazy questions of life answered at campfires 
But when here's Jesus at the campfire and he drops this on his disciples, they did not fully understand this. They had a year to more fully understand it, but you know from the stories that they still didn't understand it when he, when he was going to the cross. So Jesus is saying this, disciples, who do you say that I am? The anointed one? Yes, I'm the anointed one. I'm also the son of man who's setting up his kingdom. I'm setting up my kingdom. In fact, some of you in, 20, in 28, 27, some of you will not die until you do see the kingdom, which is here Jesus going to the cross. All right. And then I'm also the suffering, suffering servant. And so Jesus has this kingdom. He's setting up this kingdom. And so if Jesus is the kingdom in our hearts, right, he's setting up his kingdom right now. In our, that's how we realize his kingdom right now, is Jesus setting up his kingdom in our hearts. It will be absolutely fully realized when, on his second coming when he sets up his, his kingdom. And everybody, no matter believers or non-believers, everybody should bow, right, then. And since he's the kingdom, he then has requirements to get into the kingdom if you want to be if you want me to be the king of your heart i have some things that i need you to do look at verse 23 before we get there anybody heard of a man named ernest shackleton any british people heard of ernest shackleton british people people from london <laughs> so <laughs> Ernest Shackleton was a great polar expeditionary. Expeditionary, Back in 1911, 1912, he was a polar explorer at the Antarctic. And he put out in the London newspaper an advertisement for men to come along with him to absolutely go across the whole Antarctic. That was his goal, to go across the whole Antarctic circle. And so this was the ad he put in the newspaper in London. You ready? All corporations have taken this and used it for their own corporate gain. Men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, months in complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in event of success. Would you have, like, made the call... And they didn't have phones back then, but would you make like calls and say, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Let me read it again. Men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, months in complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in event of success. Like just the bitter cold for me, but like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Don't like bitter cold. And some applied. To this. In fact, he went on it. Different story. It's an amazing story. I had to research this week just to, just to see what happened. Go check it out. So Jesus here is telling this. All that is involved in following me and me being king of your heart, king of you, it's going to be difficult. But you can do it. And he said to all, if anyone, if your Bible says come after me, it's the same as if anybody would follow me. If anyone wants to follow me, if you're going to follow me, I'm going to be king of you, this is what you have to do. It's a threefold process. And it's all, this is not working your way into salvation, all right? This is not works by sal salvation by works. This is absolutely, this is what faith does. Faith is a gift, and this is the, this is what faith does when it gets into you and affects your heart, okay? So if, 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 I've given, if Jesus Christ has given you faith by grace, this is what your faith does. Number one, it does this. It denies you. You deny you. Deny yourself. What is that? Okay, so this is so opposite of the w culture we live in, right? The world says, no, don't deny yourself of anything. <laughs> That's what the world says. Don't deny yourself of anything. You should not deny yourself of nothing. Enjoy life to the fullest. Maximize 
everything that you want. And here's Jesus going, no, I want you to do this. The first thing you have to do, deny yourself. So what does this look like? If Jesus is king of your heart, if Jesus is king, and he's set up rule in your heart, what is it in your heart that comes up and makes, it makes that want to be your king, your, an idol in your life? It's called idol. So what is it that comes up that you, your flesh, wants to set up in your heart that comes and rivals Jesus Christ as king. Whatever that is, it can be, it can be anything, right? It can be, it can be money, job, possessions, ch- family. It can be, get more specifically, it can be ho- great hobbies too, right? It can be a boat. It can be a car. It can be social media. It could be likes on social media. What is it that comes up in your life and goes, I want to be king? And whatever that is, we have got, Jesus says, I want you to deny that. Actually, I want you to put that to death. I don't want that to come against me as king. So, does anything in my flesh, do I want that more than knowing Jesus Christ? Deny it. And there's some really, really good things that can be that, isn't it? In fact, we as believers, that's kind of what we do. We make really good things We can put that up as an idol against our King Jesus. And again, he's like, I want you to deny it. Push it down. Oh, so many things. And so the first thing is this. Deny yourself. Whatever in your flesh wants to be made known, whatever your flesh in your flesh is going, I I want to be king, put it to death. So, so many great things. Theologians in the past have so many great things to say about this denying self. And all of them say this. Self-denial is the very foundation of your Christian Christian discipleship. And to think about that, it absolutely is. You can't do number two, which is take up your cross, unless you deny self. Denying self is the whole foundation of our Christian faith. It is the totality of Christian life is to deny self. Because when he goes, the next one is, take up your cross daily. In the first century, when you saw somebody with a cross walking down the street, where were they going? They're going to die. They're, they're taking the cross to their death to be nailed on it and die. Does your flesh want to do that? Heck no. Your flesh is like, no, no, I do not want to go to the cross. Do not take up your cross daily. The only way that we are going to take up our cross is to deny the flesh because the flesh always, 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 always wants to set up kingship and not die. So taking up, denying self is is the absolute first foundation of everything in our Christian walk. And then we can take up the cross daily, which is, what did the cross mean to Jesus? It meant, it meant, first of all, it meant this. Are you going to be obedient to me? God, God the Father says, are you going to be obedient to me unto death? So the cross means absolute obedience. When we take up the cross, we're going, I'm going to be obedient to you, Jesus Christ. What else did it mean? It meant suffering. The cross meant suffering for Jesus Christ. So when we take our, up our cross, we're going, I'm going to take, I'm going to be absolutely obedient to you, Lord. I've denied flesh. I'm going to be obedient to you. I'm going to take up my cross unto, uh, in obedience, into, unto suffering, and even unto death. And so, if you've heard this term, so, you know, my cross to bear is my mother-in-law. You see, you've heard something like that? My mother-in-law is the cross, my, not my mother-in-law, by the way. But you've heard these things like, this is my cross to bear, this is my cross to bear. That has nothing to do with the scripture. <laughs> this scripture is about willing to let Jesus rule your life so much in obedience and suffering that you're willing to physically die for Jesus Christ. And he's saying this, don't look, he's saying this to men who are all going to die in the next many years for Jesus Christ. Jesus is about to die. He knew a lot of people were after him. All of his disciples are going to die. And he goes, look, just deny it. Deny yourself unto death for me. That's what it takes.
to do number three, which is follow me. You can't do number three, follow me. Jesus wants us to know this, church. You can't follow Jesus Christ without denying self and taking up your cross daily. You can't do three, two, one. It's always one, two, three. Now look, we're all about Jesus dying for us, right? We love it. We don't like the part where we have to die. And, that, and even, it's not just about the culture. It's about even modern day evangelicalism, right? Church, like that is, that's so foreign. We love Jesus dying, but me dying? No, that's Jesus' job. And Jesus goes, no, I want you to understand this. Deny self, and you can only do number two. If you do number one, <laughs> deny self, take up your cross, follow me. Uh, it gets more difficult. Verse 24, for whoever should save his life will do what? He's going to lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. You ever played, you know, back when you're younger and you lose something? Like, especially if you went to school in junior high. Junior high is like the meanest people in the world. These kids are just violently mean. Especially if you have red hair. Red hair in junior high. <sighs> it's a really depressing time. And if, like, if you put your pencil or something or like something you brought to school because you wanted to show somebody something because it was really special and you leave it somewhere and then you, you've, like, you kind of lost it, not really lost it, but kind of misplaced it, and all of a sudden you see it later in the day and some kid has it, he's like, hey. I'm like, well, that's mine. And he goes, what's he say? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. And you want to go over there and punch him in the face, right? Yeah, <laughs> but we don't. Back in the 70s, we did. You can't do it today. Don't do that to the world. But here, finders, lead, lo finders, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Jesus is saying this. What's he saying? He's saying just the opposite. See if I can get it straight. Finders, losers. Fi finders, weepers, losers, keepers. Finders, weepers, losers, keepers. That's, the, that's what Jesus is saying here. If you're all about seeking your own everything in this world, everything. so if you have even a, you know, this financial column, if you have a column of gains, which is the world, and Jesus' agenda here, you go to the lost column, and you've lost everything. Jesus wants us to understand this do not seek the lesser good for the greater good. I have so much more that I'm going to give you. I can give you a glimpse of that on this earth. I'm going to give you a glimpse of that, which right now for, is peace. I can go through every single day at absolute peace with whatever happens. And if you hear that I have COVID-19 next week, I have peace. I will still have peace. And God will give me any, and everybody as believers, whatever it, that takes place in two or three weeks, he will graciously give you whatever you need at that point in time for you to get through that. And I have absolute faith in that. Jesus says, I want you to do this. I want you to lose your life on this earth. And if you do that, I will, let you, I will give you so much. I will give you everything that you possibly need on this earth. Romans 8.32 Remember that, what I said at the very beginning? Romans 8.32. How will I also not give you everything? I'm not talking about sports cars and sailboats. He's talking about all the spiritual blessings that you possibly need. And actually this, and actually this, I will provide for you. I will give everything you need to, for your sustenance on this earth. God is faithful. He is absolutely, positively faithful. And this is also what happens. If we do seek if we seek the things of this life, and it's all about me getting my stuff in this life, this is my life, this is my life, this is my life. Verse 26 starts to happen. 
that stuff starts to rule and set up all kinds of idols in our life so that we become actually ashamed of Jesus Christ. His name comes up, we're like, yeah, I'm not really. Who? Jesus? Yeah. He's all right. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. What a terrible thought. I, to, to ponder that to, this week for me, I'm just like, has that, is that me? Is that me? Is that, that, do I do that? When is, it, when is it that I actually, when is it that I actually have a little kilogram of a shamedness to Jesus Christ? Like, what, does it actually happen? When is that? Hmm. When this person comes in and starts talking this way about this specific thing. You ever have that? Like, do you, do you, do you have any areas in your life where you're ashamed to even say, yeah, I actually believe about Jesus Christ is the anointed one, the Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Whatever that is, man, make sure that we get rid of it. Make sure we name it and get rid of it, knowing that, man, let's not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Verse 27, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Talk about those guys, these disciples right there. I want to set up my kingdom in your heart right now, disciples. When I go and, I'm, and I die and I'm ascended into heaven and I set up my throne next to, next to my Father in heaven, you're going to see it realized. And it's realized right now, church. It's realized now as we have the Holy Spirit. It's realized in the church. The kingdom of God sets up rule in our hearts and, he, and then his, his glory is realized as believers are part of his body of Christ, his family, and it's realized through the church. His glory is realized through the church. His kingdom is realized through the church. His church, the kingdom that's set up in our hearts and in the church, then goes forth and shows the world his kingdom. We go forth and everything that we do, when we, when we show peace, when we show mercy, when we show grace, when we show sacrifice, we're saying the kingdom of God is here. And it's through, it's th his, his rule is through our hearts. There's a guy named Polycarp. And uh, a long time ago, back in the, I think, fourth century, I think, a long time ago, I can't remember, fourth century, and he was about to be martyred, 86 years old. He was a bishop, uh, church leader, and he was sought out. They went to his house to get him and take him to be thrown in front of the animals, to be torn piece by piece. And they went to his house, 86-year-old man. He sent a bunch of people there to, to get him and rustle, you know, rustle him up and tie him up, and they get there like, he was on his face praying in somebody else's house. He's praying. He knew they knew, were, they, he knew they were coming. And they get there and they're like, why are we, why, why we got all these people to get this 86-year-old man who's on his face praying? And they're like, can you just come with us? And so they get him to the stadium. And all these people in this stadium, the Roman Colosseum, they're going, down with the atheists, those who did not believe in all the Roman gods, not the one true God, but all those who don't believe in the Roman gods, down with them, kill them, kill them, kill them, kill them. And they said, the leader said, the pro council, reproach Christ and I will set you free. And there are the lines. <laughs> they're ready to eat them up. They're hungry. And they're looking at Polycarp. They're going, I'm going to eat you, Polycarp. Polycarp does this. They're like, you reproach Christ. You, you, you deny Christ. And Polycarp says this. 86 years have I served Jesus Christ. And he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? I have wild animals here, the proconsul said. I will throw you to them if you do not repent. Call them, Polycarp said. 
set them free. It is unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to, to turn to what is evil. That's, what, like, that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Setting away the things of the world and losing your life and finding it in Jesus Christ. If you despise these, this, this, the animals, I will have you burned. Polycarp says, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and is the exting then extinguished, but you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. <laughs> like, what a spiritual giant. I mean, that having that right there, denying himself, taking up his cross, and following Jesus, even at 86 years old. Like all, this, all the suffering of life have come to realization, and he's still living his life by what Jesus said. Denying himself, taking up his cross, and following Jesus Christ. Let us be like Polycarp. Let us be what Jesus is calling in this threefold command, knowing that we get so much more greater good than the lesser goods of this world, church. Don't let the lesser worlds of the church, that because we can see them now and touch them, don't let them get in the way of Jesus Christ being king and the hope that is in him and experiencing that. Don't let, let those idols be set up. Deny self. Deny self. Follow Jesus. Take up his cross. Take up his cross. Follow Jesus. Let's bow. Father God, I just want to take a time for Lord, all the people who are listening to this Lord, for just uh, some self-introspection, Lord. Let this, let this word Lord, penetrate our hearts. Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, being the anointed, the anointed one of God, the Christ of God, the Messiah of God, for being the son of man who has a kingdom that he's ruling and that will never, ever be put to shame. Lord, for having a king that is also the suffering servant, for having a king that rules in our heart and serves us even to the point of taking all of our iniquities, all of our sinfulness upon him. Father, let that king, Jesus Christ, set up his kingdom in everybody's hearts. Lord, let us bow before him. Or not just physically, but let our hearts bow before Jesus Christ, making him king. Lord, pray that we would deny ourselves. Lord, every person that hears this, let us, Lord, take inventory in our hearts of the, of the possible idols that, are being, that, we, that we set up in our hearts that come against Jesus Christ being king. Lord, let us deny those. Lord, knowing that if we, if we refuse to deny ourselves, Lord, we are never going to find satisfaction. Father, if we seek self-preservation, we're going to lose the preservation for eternity. Father,
pray through your Holy Spirit that you would ask everybody, who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Well, let our answers be the same. The anointed one of God, King of kings, the the Son of Man, the suffering servant who has come to take away the sins of our sins of the world I'll stand.